All right, so welcome to this short video on five tips on getting students comfortable with Google Classroom. Uh, this video is just to kind of give some sometimes what might be obvious or sometimes what might be uh, really easy, quick things you can do to get students familiar with or at least understanding how the play, how Google Classroom fits into your, your larger classroom in, in intention of, of teaching and learning. So the first one that I strongly encourage uh, is to do either during class a walkthrough, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's their first time using it or their 10th time, walking through conceptually how you are thinking of the space, where you want to put, you know, where you're putting things, what your your mindset of how you're going to arrange things uh, is, is can be useful to them. I often encourage actually making that a video, uh, either doing a welcome video and or tour of the virtual space, uh, or just doing a tour of the virtual space. It can be two to three, four minutes to just talk through what's there, what's uh, what people are, you know, what they can expect in the different areas. But that can do that can do a lot of help, you know, just having that there for them to understand what the, how you plan to use the space. Uh, one thing I always, always encourage is if you're having them do anything, even within Google Classroom, again, whether it's their first or their 10th time, um, anything you're having them do, always have them do small things and then do the big things. So this is my rule whenever using any kind of technology. You know, if you want them to submit a, a major assignment, have them submit something smaller initially just so they get the hang of it. So that might be, you know, if they're going to do a paper or they're going to, you know, pass in a, a, the next step in their process project, you know, the first thing you might have them do is submit their topic. And, you know, it might be a sentence or two, but really making sure anything you have them do, if they're going to participate in a discussion, have a low stakes discussion that they initially participate in, let them work out the kinks around the technology on the lower stakes assignment so that they're not compounding the stress of the major assignment with the stress of the technology. Uh, clear language links, I can't emphasize this enough that putting into, you know, anytime you're, you're giving links or materials, what have you, into Google Classroom or wherever, to be really clear about what they are actually going to look at when they click on that. So in the example here, you know, instead of just say readings for this week, um, and I've seen this done, and I've been in classes, and this is super frustrating of like, there's no contextual information. So you might do something like short story, story of an hour by Kate Chopin, estimated reading time, 10 minutes. Uh, so really try to provide that relevant information, what the object is, you know, what is the title of it, who it is from, and what is the rough guide or, you know, eye shot of how much time they can anticipate spending on it. Now, estimated reading time is sometimes a little more complex than that, especially when it comes to reading versus viewing or, or listening, where there's definitely a confined timestamp. And what I recommend here is to say about how much time you want them to spend, either estimated in a very general sense of if you're doing more than this, then maybe take a step back and, and check in with, with you as the instructor or saying, I don't want you spending more than a half hour on this. That's, that's about how much it is of value to the class. Um, so just think about that because different reading, different reading strategies, different materials are going to call for different approaches, but trying to give them a sense of what they can anticipate or when is the point at which you would want them to stop so that there's not further frustration, uh, thinking about that. And one way, one thing I use that I have here is Readometer. Uh, and it's a nice way of if, if you have a text, you can copy it and paste it in there and it gives you a estimated reading time. Again, I would err on the side of um, of being more generous than, than, than less generous. You know, if something says it's like eight minutes, I might round it up to nine uh, or 10, but just trying to think about how you make sure they know what's expected of them and what's expected of them before they click on a link. Because none of us like to click on links to things that we're not really sure what it is we're, we're setting ourselves up for. Um, in terms of assignments, again, things that may be straightforward but are also really useful is the details. So you want that description, the who, what, where, why, and how. Um, you really want to provide a map for them about what it is you anticipate they're, they're going to do. Uh, and along with that, the due date, and this should be the day and time. Uh, and I strongly recommend, you know, we sometimes have different practices, but if they're submitting this online, I always strongly recommend thinking about where it fits in the semester and where and when you're likely to grade it. Um, so if you're gonna, you know, sometimes arbitrarily we'll decide we want it at Friday at midnight. 
are you grading Saturday morning? Because if you're not, I don't know if about the Friday midnight makes sense. So be thinking about that in terms of when you want them to submit it in relation to when you want that, when you anticipate grading it. Uh, and then also, you know, thinking about that time and, and asking yourself how important is it? it you know, is 11.59 on Friday night really important if you're not looking at it till 6 a.m. in the morning? If so, then, you know, let students know that, like, so long as they pass it in by 6 a.m., they're fine. You just want to make sure you have a deadline on the, the calendar, but just kind of be flexible with that um, or at least communicate what your, your intentions are with that. The rubric is also really important. You can do this for most assignments, and even if that assignment is complete, did not complete, or, you know, your basic like check, check minus zero, um, having one just so they understand. And, and also on your end, it'll be, it'll be both easier and consistent with them about how you're giving feedback. And the other thing I always say with, with rubrics is particularly for um, significant assignments, that's one method of feedback that shouldn't be the only method of providing feedback. Um, often, yes, you want to identify where they can improve and strengthen but you, or where their strengths are, but you also want to actually follow that up with some kind of textual or audio video uh, feedback that kind of gets a little more nuance, that tells a little bit more the story of, of how you're thinking about their, their work. Um, and whenever possible, please include examples. I often encourage, as you have students that do really interesting things, to ask them if you can use that as examples of really solid and positive uh, examples for them to use in the future. And again, examples don't have to be perfect. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they should be. They should do well, but you know, it's in, sometimes we look for it has to be the most pristine. And I would say, no, you want something that demonstrates you know, what the intention of that assignment is really well. You know, if there's, if there's commas in the wrong places, which I still make the mistake of, or if there's you know, a few hiccups there or there, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, and I include again here a basic rubric that you can always use and import that or, or adapt that into the Google Classroom environment. Um, and the last one is, you know, is using the, the question feature. So sometimes it's used for discussions. Uh, so you can have kind of short or long term uh, engagement. I use it a lot for a mixture of temperature taking. So trying to get a sense of where they are in the semester or their ideas or concerns around certain things. So just kind of popping in questions regularly that are not of any value or, or you know, are seen as participation, but aren't high stakes. And really they're just as a means of like, you know, understanding what's going on with them. That I also use them for priming for the class. So if I want to make sure in class we have a conversation around X, then maybe the week before I'm asking two or three questions or asking them to answer a question or two so that we all have a starting point. We all have a place where we're like ready or most of us have a place where we're ready to jump into a discussion or further um, further move along with the, the concepts that we're exploring. So those are my five ideas or five uh, tips for uh, engaging with Google Classroom and getting your students in there and comfortable. It's really about thinking, you know, about back and forth, thinking about clarity and thinking about how you make sure they feel, you know, they understand how you're using that space. Um, so that pre-communication, the, the pre-course communication or as they're starting the course, and then as you're going along using things like the questions to let them know that's an important space that you want to go back to. It's not just you go there, get the readings, but it'll be a place you go to interact and, uh, and engage. So that's all for now. If you have other tips along uh, using Google Classroom or have other ideas about uh, what you'd like to see, always feel free to reach out and email me. Thank you so much.